Uh, good evening, everyone. Hope you are doing well. Uh, today, we are going to do a session on the recently concluded uh, specialty certificate exam in June 2024. And this is part one of the session where we are co cover 20 exam themes which had appeared in the recent exam. These are extremely high yield for the upcoming exams as well. As you all know that there is an upcoming SC exam in November this year, followed by the European Board exam in endocrinology in December of this year. So wish you all the best and let's start right away. So one of the exam themes and which or questions which appear in the exam is uh, which hormonal increase is responsible for the gestational diabetes or the diabetes of pregnancy? The correct answer was human placental lactogen. So in terms of placental hormones during pregnancy, the body produces high level of number of hormones. One of them being the human placental lactogen. Second, the human placental growth hormone, then estrogen, progesterone, these hormones and the human placental lactogen in particular reduce the effectiveness of the insulin so as to leading to gestational diabetes. So as your baby grows, a higher level of these hormones are needed. And as a result, the further into the pregnancy, the higher the likelihood of insulin resistance and development of gestational diabetes. The human placental lactogen and human placental growth hormone are the top two in this regards. These hormones are produced by the placenta during pregnancy and assist with the feeding and the growth of the baby. During pregnancy, levels of these hormones increase significantly with the human placental lactogen or HPL increasing by up to 30 times and the human placental growth hormone increasing by up to eight times. So the correct answer for this question in the exam was human placental lactogen. And the research does indicate that both these hormones can lead to increase and even severe insulin resistance so as to the cause of GDM or gestational diabetes. The second question which had appeared in the exams was uh, when to check the traps or what we refer to as the TSH receptor antibodies or basically the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin during pregnancy. The correct answer is in the first trimester and at the beginning of the third trimester. So this is based on the guidelines. So all women with previous or current Graves disease should have traps measured in the first trimester to identify at-risk pregnancies. Secondly, circulating traps in the mother can cross the placenta and in these, rather than the thyroid status of the mother, that can cause neonatal thyrotoxicosis. The fetal TSH receptor responds to stimulation from maternal traps by 18 weeks gestation. The risk of hypothyroidism to the neonate can be assessed by measuring traps again at the beginning of the third trimester. So it's important to note, uh, as was asked in the exams, to measure the traps in the first trimester and at the beginning of the third trimester. Remember, the thyroglobulin antibodies or the TPO antibodies have no effect on the fetus. The trap to be measured in the first trimester and beginning of the third trimester. Third question theme, which was asked, third question which was asked, the pathophysiology of a patient with cystic fibrosis diabetes. So the correct answer is, pancreatic exocrine dysfunction. So the pathophysiology of CFRD or cystic fibrosis related diabetes is complex. The primary defect is insulin deficiency and usually manifest as progressive loss of insulin secretory ability. Pancreatic exocrine dysfunction is a major feature in the development of diabetes and cystic fibrosis and was the correct answer for this question in the exam. A bit of comparison between type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and CFRD. As we know that the type 1 diabetes is more of an acute onset, where it is insidious for type 2 and CFRD. The peak age of onset is childhood and adolescent for type 1, adults for type 2, and childhood onwards for CFRD. Important things which we should remember and note for the exams is the insulin secretion. If it becomes eventually absent in type 1 diabetes, decreased in type 2 diabetes. The important pathophysiology is impaired first phase insulin secretion in cystic fibrosis related diabetes, asked several times in the exam before, and this leads typically to postprandial hyperglycemia. Insulin sensitivity is also somewhat decreased in uh, CFRD patients. Treatment is, of course, insulin for CFRD and type 1 diabetes. 
uh, they are very rarely ketosis prone, the patients with cystic fibrosis related diabetes. Microvascular complications are possible, but fewer and very rare reports of macrovascular complications from fish for patients of CFRD. Cause of death in patients with cystic fibrosis related diabetes is usually pulmonary disease. So again, very important to note all the important things about CFRD asked uh, very commonly in the exams. Remember pancreatic exocrine dysfunction and remember the impaired first phase insulin secretion leading to postprandial hyperglycemia in this category of patients. Uh, another question very commonly asked in the previous exams as well and even this exams, the ratio of T4 is to T3. The correct answer is 15 is to 1. Perfect physiological T4 to T3 ratio secreted from healthy human thyroid gland. It is approximately 15 is to 1. Uh, of course, many references cite different uh, ratios and it usually varies between 13 is to 1 to 16 is to 1. So 15 is to 1 was the correct answer for the question which appeared in the recent exam. So another question theme which appeared in the recent exams was asking about risk factor for relapse of Graves' disease. And the answer is orbitopathy. So relapses are most likely to occur within the first year and more likely to occur in the presence of a large goiter, orbitopathy, current smokers, and high T4 level at the time of diagnosis. Or in the presence, of course, if the traps are persistent, even at the end of the treatment, there is a high chance of relapse for the graves and uh, persistence of traps towards the end of the treatment is a, another risk factor or another risk factor for relapse of graves disease. Also, males have a higher recurrence rate than females. So important to note, all these are risk factors for developing a relapse of graves disease. So patients with multinodular goiter and thyroid nodules and thyrotoxicosis always tend to relapse on cessation of antithyroid drugs. And in this category of patient where we talk about toxic adenoma or toxic nodule or toxic multinodular goiter, a definitely treatment option like radioiodine or surgery is usually available. Uh, another question theme appeared in, in the exam is about NIFTP in the final histology and what is the next step in terms of the thyroid case. So it is discharged. So what is NIFT? NIFTB is a non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary-like nuclear features, also referred to as NIFTP. It is a variant of papillary thyroid cancer, but subsequently reclassified as non-malignant variant because it does not have either vascular or tumor capsule invasion. It has got excellent prognosis. And while thyroid surgery is required to distinguish NIFTP from the encapsulated with the invasion subtype, therapy beyond thyroid lobectomy is usually not required in this case scenario. So the next step will be discharge and not completion thyroidectomy, just to lobectomy is good enough. Another question which had appeared in the exam is the antipsychotic medication, which is associated with causing hyperglycemia or diabetes. Correct answer is olanzapine. Uh, very important chart here. Uh, we're looking at the selected adverse effects of antipsychotic medications for schizophrenia. Special, pay, pay special attention to the, the ones which affect the glucose. We can clearly see olanzapine. We can see clozapine. These are the two having the most effect on causing the hyperglycemia and diabetes. Uh, the least effect we can say is um, uh, medications like aripiprazole. So that has a minimal effect. And uh, also we can say uh, uh, certain medications like uh, uh, Brex, p as well, and Caliprazine as well, which has minimal effect on the glucose abnormalities. But the most is the clozapine and olanzapine. Also very commonly asked in the exams, uh, the other thing from the endocrine perspective is the prolactin elevation. As you can clearly see that the drugs which minimal prolactin elevation is Arpiprazole, again, a drug of choice in these patients so where we are concerned about the prolactin elevation. So it has minimal effect on the prolactin, whereas uh, medications like olanzapine and paliperidone, especially the paliperidone has the highest incidence of prolactin elevation. So things to keep in mind from this chart, especially in context of the glucose abnormalities as well as prolactin elevation. Also keep in mind about the weight gain. So olanzapine as well as clozapine, maximum incidence of weight gain. In terms of hyperlipidemia as well, clozapine and olanzapine, 
uh, maximum effect on the cholesterol profile as well. So these are some selected adverse effects of antipsychotic medications, which we should keep in mind in context of endocrinology and diabetes. And this was asked in the recent exams, olanzapine was the answer as regards to diabetes. So a type 2 diabetic patient with history of established CVD, what is the LDL cholesterol goal? So we should aim for a 50% reduction from baseline. This is as per guidelines. So the most recent European Society Cardiology Guidelines educate aggressive lipid management in individuals with diabetes and suggest dividing patients into three categories. Number one is moderate risk. These are patients with type 1 diabetes less than 35-year-old or type 2 diabetes less than 50-year-old with diabetes duration of less than 10 years and no other risk factors. High-risk patients are patients with diabetes duration of more than 10 years, usually with an additional risk factor, but no end organ damage. And of course, very high-risk patients are patients with established CVD like this patient, target organ damage or multiple risk factors or diabetes duration more than 20 years. So in patients, we are aiming for a total cholesterol of less than four. We are aiming for patients with moderate risk to have an LDL cholesterol of less than 2.5, high-risk patients to be less than 1.8, and very high-risk patients like this patient the LDL cholesterol absolute value should be less than 1.4 millimole per liter or at least 50% reduction from the baseline, which was the answer in this case. HDL cholesterol target more than 1 millimole per liter and price size less than 2.0. Uh, Denazumab, an anti-osteoporosis medication. Uh, common side effect was asked in the exam. Skin infections, eczema, uh, tops the list. So, Denazumab is effective for at least 10 years, is an effective alternative to bisphosphonates. Drug works by inhibiting rank uh, ligand, which is a very commonly asked uh, mechanism of action in the exams. It is a receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B. So it's important to remember this as well. And thus it inhibits the osteoclast. Hence, there is a reduction in the bone turnover and bone loss is prevented. Common side effects, skin infection, the eczema, which was asked in the exam. It can also cause hypocalcemia, so we should ensure the calcium and the vitamin D levels are normal prior to starting this. Always make sure if you're going to take a break from this treatment, uh, always follow up with an alternative like bisphosphonate. Otherwise, there is an increased risk of multiple vertebral fractures if there is discontinuation from the treatment. Number 10, gene mutation for the familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia was asked, and the correct answer is inactivating mutation of the CSR gene encoding the calcium sensing receptor. So it is a rare disease, but the incidence is still uh, 1 is to 80,000 compared to a more common one, which is primary hyperparathyroidism, which is 1 is to 1,000. It is predominantly autosomal dominant FHH, rarely can be autosomal recessive. Mutation, as I mentioned, is in the calcium sensing receptor gene. Uh, it reduces its sensitivity such that the body behaves as if it were experiencing normal calcemia, even though serum calcium level is elevated. Characteristically, we see hypercalcemia, hypocalciuria, and PTH within the reference range or mildly elevated. Important is to differentiate it from primary hyperparathyroidism as these patients do not benefit from parathyroidectomy. The homozygous state is very rare. It can produce severe life-threatening hypercalcemia soon after birth. And in such cases, total parathyroidectomy can be life-saving. Tetrozygous state, which we commonly see, is generally benign and unassociated with any symptoms or adverse events, such as renal stones or bone disease, doesn't happen in this condition. And the treatment is usually non-specific. What we do is we do the calculation of the calcium creatinine excretion ratio. This is less than 0.01 in FHH and more than 0.02 in primary hyperparathyroidism. So that's the end of my free view. Uh, in this part one, I've actually covered 20 themes in my full session. So if you like to listen to the full session, which has full 20 themes, please subscribe to my lecture series. Uh, currently, there are 73 videos uh, in my lecture series. And uh, once you gain access to the full set, uh, lecture series, you will be able to listen to this full video as well, plus all my existing 72 other videos. And also, you will get lifetime access for all my upcoming videos. So you can uh, take a subscription by emailing me on my email ID, or you can WhatsApp me on the number which is displayed on the screen. So thank you so much and wish you all the best for the exam.